Hello everyone and welcome to the tutorial for uh, 3D stereo photometrics for Gearotic. Uh, some of you have seen this video that's on the screen at the moment. This was printing on a up 3D printer, a hologram uh, from the preliminary output of this module. It's been refined quite a bit since. It actually puts out a higher resolution than what you're seeing on the screen at the moment. Uh, this particular uh, print was made by printing an inward face um, off of a capture. Um, you may have seen uh, some of the other examples. I'm just going to flash on the screen for a second. Uh, the photographs really don't do them justice. Uh, they need to be seen to be believed in terms of uh, just how nice they look. So with all that having been said, um, let's take a look. All right, so let's take a look at what it takes to make these 3D sculptures and uh, what you need to know. The more you understand the way these things are produced, the better your sculpture is going to end up being. I can tell you they vary a lot, and uh, as you gain more experience in making them, uh, they actually come out very nicely. All right, let's take a look at the controls on the screen, and then uh, we'll explain it through, and then we'll do a test acquisition. First of all, under step one here on the left, you'll see select your camera. Uh, most of you would only have one here, but uh, if you have two, you can select two. I have not tested yet the switching between cameras, um, simply because I only have one camera. So let me know how that works out for you. We have a resolutions box, which at the moment is showing two resolutions of each type. Select the first of the two. Uh, at least that's what works here. If that doesn't work, select the second one. They actually relate to two different interfaces, and... Uh, since this is brand new, uh, it's very hard for me to tell which one is proper. So I'm going to give you both, and you let me know whether it's the first one or the second one. Um, you're going to be very tempted to go to extremely high resolutions, like 1920 by 1080 or uh, 1280 by 720. Um, you should probably resist the temptation until you get very experienced with it. Um, this is a very fast process until you get too much data. Uh, 640 by 480 is a reasonable time. Uh, 800 by 600 takes a bit longer, and if you get up to 1920, uh, you'll probably run out of RAM uh, before you'll be able to generate it. Uh, but we'll talk about that more uh, as we go along. Uh, I'm going to select 176 by 144, which is a very low uh, resolution uh, for this test. And you'll see under that we have a select button. Uh, if you hit the select button, you will select that camera at the selected resolution. You have a configure button that you can uh, bring up, which you can set your focus and other settings that your camera lets you use. Uh, this program has only been tested, or this module has only been tested by a couple of other people, and I can tell you that one of them has found that unchecking the automatic uh, calibration was the secret to him getting good exposures. I find leaving it on is fine. I'm using a Microsoft Life Cam. Uh, sometimes I have to goose the focus a little bit because it's not very good at finding focus. But other than that, the Life Cam seems to work pretty good. Underneath the Select and Configure buttons, you'll see a Video Sampling On button. When you check that, normally that would turn on the video. At the moment, I'm not going to turn it on because I have a uh, calibration set on the screen that we'll discuss in a moment. But that's where you would start the process. You've selected your camera, and now you're going to check video sampling on, and video would normally come on on this center square of the screen. In fact, it will be the only square there at the time. Camera rotation is, um, if you have a, a, a camera and you want to frame things in a portrait instead of a landscape uh, mode, you may be tempted to turn your webcam on its side in order to frame your face properly. Um, I allow you to do that, but the flashing of the monitor has to be in a certain sequence. So you have to tell me which way you've rotated the camera, clockwise or counterclockwise. You'll notice mine says center. That means it's just uh, the webcam is um, just standing in normal orientation. Um, for the best shots that I do, I put my camera in the middle of my monitor and turn it to face outwards. Uh, I have done a great many of them with the camera sitting on top of the monitor as well, so it will work either way. Uh, if it's on top of the monitor, you have to keep in mind, uh, if you're looking up at it, expect your face to have a tilt on it when, uh, when it actually gets extruded. Uh, we'll go into that later. Um, step two, acquire the images. Now, you'll notice we have a drop-down box which has 10 milliseconds, 
all the way up to one second uh, selectable. This is because some web cameras adjust faster than others. There's things like white balance and exposure and so on. And I'm flashing the monitor as quickly as you want um, it flashed. I suggest 250 milliseconds. I've gotten a great many nice exposures at 50 milliseconds as well. The idea here is to make it as fast as you can and yet get as much light as you can um, because you don't want movement. And then there's a fire button. And when you push fire, you're going to get a flashing screen, first on the right, then the top, then the left, and then on the bottom. This flashing screen is to put light on the object uh, from different sides. And with each flash, it will take a uh, single frame of the object that's in front of the camera. Underneath this, we have uh, flash reduction. Leave that on zero for now. It's a way to reduce the size of each flash fire in order to um, lower the specular highlights that might bounce off your nose and so on. Uh, under that, we'll see confidence. Now, this confidence number, um, the higher, the better, usually. <laughs> And I can't, it's a unitless number. I can't tell you what number is good or bad. All I can tell you is the higher the better, provided you didn't move. Two things will cause uh, this confidence number to go up. The confidence number is actually the standard deviation between the four images. So with a 37 standard deviation, uh, given that nothing has changed other than light, it means it's seeing a nice strong response or a nice strong difference from image to image. Um, if the monitor was turned off and we didn't see any change, you'd expect the confidence to be zero because uh, as long as you didn't move, the light would be the same on all four uh, images. Now, on the other hand, if you were to move, it's going to see the misregistration of that object and it's going to assume a high confidence. You could get a number up to 80 or 90. I've never seen it uh, get higher than 70. And uh, to get 70, you have to be smoking or have smoke in the scene or move your arms or something. So anyway, uh, 37 is a very good number for a stationary object. And you can see that the object on the screen is an egg. Uh, this is just a standard egg. It's sitting on a roll of, uh, uh, of uh, kitchen towel just to hold it. And I'm using an egg uh, for obvious reasons. An egg has a nice grayscale from each side and uh, gives us a, a, a phantom to use to explain the concept here. So we have a confidence of 37 on this egg. We had turned on the video sample, we did a fire, we shot four shots, and the four shots then show up on the screen. Now these shots represent, um, this picture for example would be the egg lit up from the uh, right hand side because the right hand side of the monitor had flashed. The top image is lit when the top of the monitor flashes, left and bottom. And this can be very hard to see. A person looking at these four images would be forgiven for thinking that they're all identical. Uh, they're not. And that's where we get to step three. In step three, we're going to calculate the normals. Now, for the, those of you who don't know what a normal is and haven't dealt with CAD enough to know, uh, a normal is simply the direction uh, that any pixel on that image is facing. So as you can imagine, the pixels in this part of the egg on the right-hand side that are well lit up at the moment are probably push pointing to the right in various degrees. And as they move forward to the center of the egg, now they're, move, they're pointed straight at me. And as they move to the left of the egg, they're pointing to the left. And the calculate normals is a mathematical process which is going to take a look at the shadows, which are barely visible on these four images, and from them calculate out um, a normals map which shows us where every pixel of this image is facing. So I'm going to hit uh, Calculate Normals. And you can see a split second later, we end up with the four images changed and a new image on the screen. I'm going to hit Alt-5 to go to full screen so we can take a look at these. So on the image on the right, you can see we have our egg. And it's almost uh, black in the very front of the egg. And it slowly gets more white. And that makes sense because a white pixel is a fragment of shell pointing straight to the right. As it gets grayer to dark, it's pointing more and more towards us. The same thing on the roll of paper towel, which is holding up the egg. It's also being lit from that side. So it saw a flash from the monitor on that side. If we go to the top image, here we can see the areas of our picture which were hit by light only from the top. So we see the very top of our paper roll. 
and we see the top of the egg. And we see a little bit of the bottom of the egg. And this is uh, trans reflectance. This is light bouncing off the paper towel onto the egg um, from the light up top. Things like this is what cause errors in the process. And, and we'll talk about errors. You can have a lot of errors in this process and still have it work quite well. From the left, obviously, we're seeing a nice response. And then we're saying that these are the areas that are pointing from straight to us to downwards. There's no real white white ones, so it's not pointing too far down. And then we have what's called an albedo image, this image down here on the bottom. This is a representation of the image if it were lit evenly from all directions at once, all four directions. In other words, it's the object with no shadows. Now, obviously, you can still see some shadows in here, and those shadows will add more noise to the system. This um, process is all about light and noise. This is a very good response in these uh, five images, so I would expect a, a very good uh, return. So I'm going to go Alt-5 and bring back our screen. So we've generated our normals. Things look uh, pretty good. We have two things under the Calculate Normals button. We have a gradient scale which goes from 0 0.06 up to 2. Um, this is how far out the object is going to be pulled, or the weight of the gradients. The way this process works is these four normal pictures are just representative of what is really one data set of normals. Um, and this is what's referred to as a gradient field. Every pixel within that square photograph has a pressure on it, a pressure pointing to the left pointing to the right and pointing down. And the three pressures vary across the entire matrix. So we're going to do something called a Gauss-Seidel relaxation, which is an iterative process that slowly allows those weights to sum up and pull the image out. And this gradient scales how much weight we're going to give to that, uh, those pressures. It's like an amplification dial. If you go all the way up to two, that's the most amplification that you can get, and the egg would come way out. Um, if you went down to point 0.2, that's the least magnification, and it won't come far out. So let's, let's try a couple, because once you have the data, you can simply go from this, um, from the gradient scale and create 3D and go back and forth between step 3 and step 4 uh, in order to create more and more off of the same data set so that you don't have to take more acquisitions. So I'm going to select 1 on this gradient scale, and then I'm going to hit the Create 3D button uh, on step 4. And when I do that, you're going to hear a lot of noise. I'm going to turn off the audio. If the noise gets to you, uh, turn off the audio. You'll notice i got a lot of bings and bangs going on there, which I'll explain in a moment. But because we're using a very low resolution on the camera, it's only 176 by 144, uh, this process goes very fast. So here is what came out of our image uh, from the egg. And you can see it looks very much like an egg sitting on a paper towel. Uh, it came out very far, quite deep, and that's with a, a, a gradient scale of 1. And what that means is that this was an excellent capture. Normally you would have to go up to a gradient scale of near 2 to get this kind of pull. You can see it's not really accurately an egg. This is because of differences in shadow, uh, noise, uh, and other things that go on in the image. This process, because it's a gradient field, Every part of the field controls the final result. Um, every part of the field is like the bacon soda baking bread. And if it, the chemistry isn't just right, it doesn't raise just right. Uh, future enhancements will probably allow you to circle off one area because that would mask out areas that contribute noise if they're not valuable to you. But this was a very good result. Let's slide the gradient scale down to uh, 0.11 and try that again. And I'm going to hit Stop Growth. Now, you notice when I hit Create 3D, it started iterating. And up here at the top of the screen, you can see 100 iterations, next update at 150, and so on. It keeps doing iterations and updating of every 150 uh, times through in order to um, do it as quickly as possible. Now, that looked like it was going very fast. But if I was using 640 by 480, you'd get one of those updates every three seconds or so. If you were using an even higher resolution, like 800 by 600, it might take you 20 seconds per uh, iteration. Now, the iterations will continue forever uh, until you hit the Stop Growth button. 
Now, depending on the strength of your data and how good you've done of removing noise, um, you'll either get a really good pullout and it will stop pulling out, which is called reaching convergence. If it does converge, it will stop pulling out uh, and it'll just sit there iterating forever until you stop it. Other models you'll find will keep pulling out quite a distance and you're going to want to stop them before they hit convergence. Uh, to see what I mean, let's start this again. I'm going to hit Create 3D. Uh, you can hear the noises of the iterations updating. It's going so fast, it's already over 3,000 iterations. And it's just not changing. It's uh, static. So this has converged. And that's with a uh, 0.11 on our scale, and it's actually quite a thin object, so it would be good for a type of bas relief uh, decoration. Uh, if you had a flower or something like this, it would make an excellent type of carving. Now let's take it up to the other scale, 2, and see what that does for us. Now you can see within a f very few iterations, the egg has pulled out. It's actually close to being accurately an egg. Um, that was a really good acquisition. You can even see the dimples on the paper towel. The detail that you get from this technique is very good. But you'll notice the distortion in the plane and so on. That's why this is an artistic type of module, not an engineering one. Uh, accuracy is going to be very hard to get. That having been said, though, you can get some very nice uh, engravings uh, of a great many types of things in order to embellish um, things like pendulums and the faces of clocks and so on. Um, so let's say that we have, oh, there's another thing, the albedo image that we created earlier. You can always put it on to see what it looks like by hitting the texture button. Um, now you end up with the object with a texture over it. Now this is something that you see on the web quite frequently. Um, they'll show you a 3D uh, program to bring out 3D images and they'll put an image on it. And uh, you should always make sure when you look at such a program that they also allow you to t turn the image off because sometimes that picture that you're putting on top makes it look like a much better 3D object than it is and when you turn it off you find out it's not quite as impressive. Uh, this one's actually pretty good for a 3D image so it's a bad example. Uh, there's another button here called Neg which is a negative pull. So we hit 3D and I'm going to stop growth. Now this looks as if we just got the same thing but in actual fact that egg um, is facing inwards and creates an optical illusion. Uh, the human brain is wired to recognize things and when it sees a shape like this it, it immediately pops it outwards. Now I'm going to rotate this image from um, left to right and you can see that it looks like it's, it's rotating from right to left but as I reach the point where it cuts off your brain suddenly says oh that's an inny. But the second I pass a certain point the brain flips around again and suddenly it's an outie until you get to that point where it says, ah, now I can see. So this is what the negative button does. Now, um, you would think it's not important because something that looks like this can also look like this, but when you generate this object for 3D printing or to put it out as an STL, I put it on a pedestal for you. So in this case, I would create the pedestal downward so that you have an inward-looking hologram. Um, this is that's how the uh, hologram of my head for example was done if you machine a face inwards you'll get a very nice holographic image if you hold it up to the light or if the shadows uh, approach it properly so unchecking the gate and you'll get the other effect uh, where the object comes outwards so we've stopped the growth and we have our image and if this was our face we'd be looking at it and saying okay cool let's uh, machine that well we have another step to go through first uh, this is what's called a dense mesh. In order to create this gradient field, you want to have quite a bit of data, so uh, there's actually one vertex point for every pixel of the camera image. Uh, that makes for a lot of vertices. In this case, I'm using a very coarse uh, video resolution of 176 by 144. Uh, so because of that, we only have 25,000 vertices. But we have a decimate button, and if we hit it, it will always cut the vertices down by half and it can take a few seconds to work you might be waiting 30 seconds there is no progress bar on it as yet it just kind of locks up for you uh, in this case we're down to 12,000 vertices and if I was to hit it again uh, you'll see at 12,000 though the image looks almost identical but we have half as many vertices um, so you can usually decimate quite a bit before you lose it all if I decimate again we're now at 6,000 vertices and it still looks fairly identical to where we started. 
So let's decimate again down to 3,000. And now if you look closely, we're starting to get a little blocky. If we look at the egg, you can now see our triangulations, especially at the seam uh, where reflectance was coming off of the back of other objects. So if you decimate too much, uh, you'll lose detail that might be important to you. There is no backup. Uh, if I decimate again, you can see she's just getting blockier and blockier until we get to the point where it's hardly a representation, representation of an egg at all. Uh, but you can always go back and uh, restart by hitting Calculate Normals to bring back your normal images and then create the 3D and then stop. Um, once you're finished decimating, you've taken it down to the point that you're happy with and you now want to put that out to the program, uh, you would hit the Add STL button. Now keep your eye on the messages at the top of the screen because if I hit Add STL now, I get a warning message saying change size of output from pixels to inches or millimeters. And this is because it knows that the output size box is still set to the video size. So it's assuming that's not the size you want. So in my case, it's asking me to enter a size that I want. So if I enter 50 in the X, for example, it will automatically change it for aspect ratio for the Y and the Z. Um, you can check the uncheck the aspect lock if you wish and then add a higher Z if you wish to scale that out more. Um, you won't see the effect until you generate it. But again, in the fall I'm willing to look at a great number of enhancements to this module if people find that it has its use. Um, so let's create this. We've uh, done everything we need to do so now we hit add STL and now it appears in the program. And you can see when it appears in the program it's now centered onto a little plaque ready for machining. Um, that's another change that I think we should probably make in the fall is to add a circular pendant for it, maybe a dish shaped uh, pendant for it to sit in. Um, but there is your object uh, ready to be machined. Now in order to get that put out as an STL um, you're going to want to hit the STL button up here on the tools menu and when you do that you'll go to this screen here combination logic down here uh, almost always and I'm going to change this default um, you're going to go want to go to output all individually click on the object so that it's in your objects to export, export and then hit export uh, you may be asked if you haven't got a project name yet what the project name is going to be let's call this egg for the heck of it and up at the top, you'll get a message, uh, submit it for export, a bar at the top will climb to the top, and then back, and then you're back to normal. From there, you can go back to the project screen if you wish, um, or back to the stereo photo. Uh, once you've left the stereo photo, uh, you have to start over again uh, in order to start again, and always take a look at what you've got selected, because it doesn't remember anything yet in terms of what your favorites might be. Um, you'll notice that um, on the resolution, if I hit select, um, I'll get a message, video device selected and initialized. And over here on output size, it will automatically go to that output size. And the reason I mention that is that's a verification of what your resolution is. If I just select, for example, uh, the second 800 by 448, that's a video 2 interface. It's not going to work even though I ask for it. And if I ask for it, it will tell me I'm selected and initialized, but over here in the output size, it still says 640 by 480. So after you select a resolution, look and hit select. Look over here to the right to make sure that it actually took. Uh, these are considered suggestions to the system, um, so you have to make sure that it actually took. All right, so now that all of that's been said, let's try a uh, fresh acquisition and see what happens. Okay, as I sit here in this darkened room, I'm going to turn off this monitor beside me because I can see that that's putting a lot of light on the scene. You want to make sure that your scene is fairly even. Uh, I'm going to select a 250 millisecond and hit fire. And you can see the flashing light and we have our four images. I have a confidence of 27. Now if I take this down to 50 milliseconds and try the same firing sequence, I have a 24 confidence. So as you can see, the higher the number, the higher your confidence that you're going to get. That having been said, 24 or 27 is pretty good. And that time we got 30. 
So you may want to do the firing sequence several times. Now if I use a flash reduction to try to get rid of specular highlights, watch what happens when I take it down. My confidence is 29, which is pretty good. In other words, that, that flash reduction uh, had an effect because it didn't get any uh, reflectance coming from a uh, dual side, and it, and it liked to see that. So you got a confidence of 29. Let's try that again. Um, that gave us a 31 confidence, which, again, is pretty good. So we're going to keep that. Uh, play around with your times and so on until you're getting a good confidence and that you feel that you know what's going on. Now let's go to the Calculate Normals. Because when you look at the four images that are surrounding my head, yes, it kind of looks like the Brady Bunch, I know, but when you see the four images, it's very hard to tell uh, what differences are there. Uh, the human eye is not very good at it. Uh, when you look closely, you will see there are definitive differences, but again, it's hard to see at a glance. So let's hit Calculate Normals and uh, see what we get. Okay, so there's our Calculate Normals. And... Let's zoom in on the images for a little bit. As you can see, my face is lit only from the right on this image. That's a good sign. Top, left, and bottom. Our albedo image looks fairly well shaded all throughout. Um, so let's take a look at a gradient scale. Oh, we have a convolve button. The convolve button will do a convolution filter, which is a short quadratic sequence, which is added to every uh, string of bytes, and that forces them all into a quadratic curve. It is also a convergent filter, though, so you can hit it several times. It may only work the first time. It may work for the first several presses. Uh, as you can see, it's now much more spread out and much more even uh, throughout the image, so that's a good sign. So I'm going to take this down to a gradient scale of 0.45 and let's do a creation on it and see what happens. Now, uh, it takes a few seconds to start up. I'm at a higher resolution than we were last time. Uh, and you'll see that it's much slower when it's updating. And if you, you can rotate in between updates and zoom in and so on. And you can see it's not pulling out a great deal. It's um, it is what you would call more of a, uh, an emboss than anything else, a low-level bas relief or emboss. Now, this could take uh, a couple minutes to converge, and I think it's approaching convergence on this particular uh, gradient scale. And if I zoom in, you can see each time it goes chunk, uh, a split second later the image changes just slightly as it grows outward. And when you see that it's not growing much per update, that means that you've hit convergence. So you might as well hit stop growth. Um, so if you were looking for a fairly flat uh, type of engraving, this was a good image for that uh, and a good gradient pull. Now, in order to get it to come out more, we'll pull up our gradient scale to like 1.5 and see what that does. Uh, all you have to do is hit Create 3D again, and it will start over. And now you'll see that each time it updates, it's pulling out quite a bit more. It's quite a bit more aggressive in its pull. Now again, how much these images pull out depend on how much noise is throughout the image. And whether or not they converge also depends on how much noise and how, how wrong it is on its assumption of normals through the image. So your quality will vary quite a bit from image to image and from acquisition to acquisition. And you'll slowly learn uh, yourself what works best for you. And sometimes you're going to want to leave the acquisition go for four or five minutes. Other times you're just going to want st to stop it and start over. Let's stop this one, for example. Uh, take a look at this a little bit more critically. You can see they can look awful weird from below and behind and so on. Um, and that's not a great image because I think we just had too much light reflecting in from the back. It may be our convol convolution was uh, that disturbed it as well. I've found sometimes the convolution helps, other times it doesn't. You can always undo that by hitting the Calculate Normals again and then hitting Create 3D again uh, without hitting Convolve. And let's see what that does for us. Actually, that seemed to have smoothed it out quite a bit. I'm going to do some investigation into the Convolve to see if there, uh, I can come up with a better filter that won't affect it quite so badly. Because here you can see that my face is actually pulling out quite nicely 
and quite a bit on each pole. Now these things look tend to look very nice from the front and when you go sideways you say oh my god they're not very thick and they haven't pulled out very much. Again noise will stop them pulling out but there's also a thing called the bass relief ambiguity uh, which says that the math cannot tell exactly how far to pull them out. What it does is it creates an object which will create the same shading as those three light sources would create. But it can't necessarily resolve the ambiguity of how far out it must be in order to truly match that object. So eventually you just, I think that we've converged on this one, so I'll just stop it. Now, you'll notice because I'm on 640 by 480 uh, that it's telling me that I have th 307,000 vertices. Uh, since this is a square matrix arrangement, that means we have a little over 614,000 triangles in this object, and that's quite a bit. But you can see there's a lot of detail to this image. Um, the, the pupils of the eyes and so on, everything has a fair degree of realism to it. Um, and just so that this is clear to everyone, there is no coloring in this image at all. All the shading that you see on this image is shadow from spotlights that are being directed at the image. And if we zoom in, you'll see that every color in the image, even right down to the pupil, is simply being caused by the tilt of a triangle. And they tilt in various levels and proportions. So anyway, this is a very high resolution. And as a 3D print, I, I know I've printed several, that this would work pretty good. You'll see on the tip of my nose, it looks like I have a zit, uh, where no zit exists. This is a specular highlight. If you were to powder your nose, you could make this go away, or perhaps turning down the lights a little bit uh, would also make it go away. But you're going to find specular highlights caused raised areas. And in fact, if we look at these eyes from the side, you'll see that the specular highlight inside my pupil has caused a little cone to come out right there on each eye. And that actually comes out in the print as well. Uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if you look at these from the front, um, it's the shadowing which is which is what leads people to uh, find them incredibly real when you make them. Okay, so we uh, want to create that, but you don't want to create it with 307,000 vertices. It'll take you four or five minutes to create it, and it'll slow down any program that you put it into. So you want to keep an eye on the quality at this point and hit the decimate button. Um, I have not yet put progress sliders for the decimate button, so when you hit it, uh, just keep your eye on the vertices until you see them drop. It generally doesn't take very long. We've already dropped to 153,000 vertices, so th 300,000 triangles, um, and it looks pretty much the same. I mean, you can't really see any loss except the specular highlights that were in these eyeballs. You'll see they're not quite as sharp as they were they're gone. The program has decided that they were sacrificial. And the blemish on my nose is now starting to go down a little bit. So let's um, decimate that again. Now we're down to 76,000. Uh, so 140,000 triangles. And as you can see, the quality is still uh, pretty darn good for machining. I think we can decimate a couple more times. 19,000. So this is a little over 30,000 triangles. And when we zoom in, now you can see that he's built up of triangles. And depending on what you're machining and what process you're using, 3D printing or what have you, uh, this may be enough that, uh, because it really does represent the angles of your face quite nicely. You can see around the eyes, uh, the shallows and uh, wear and tear from many years of doing customer support, <laughs> bleeding around, around the eyes causing shallows. Uh, it's all very very nicely coming out as uh, a machinable surface. So at this point you would say 19,000 vertices as nothing, so I'm going to hit add STL and there's our message, change size of output. So I'm going to change the size and say I want this to be 100 millimeters in size. Now I could hit STL. Now the second thing is you can add a texture to this and when you rotate it'll begin to become an eerie uh, type of photograph. Now, if you add STL to the program uh, with this image on it, it will permanently be on it in the project page. Uh, I haven't yet added a selection to take a texture off, so I recommend you leave the texture off if you want to see what kind of machining result you're going to get. Now you can hit STL, uh, and now our object is on the page. Now, uh, I have two of these on the page now. We have our egg, 
and uh, and our relief. So I'm just going to uh, delete this egg. And there is our face. When we selected it's blue, if I select a shaft, of course, we go back to our material color. You'll notice it looks a lot better in its background color than it does in its material color, and it's because it more accurately reflects what shadows would look like. But these things are highly material dependent in terms of uh, what you're going to see because it really does ref rely on shadows. Something flat that doesn't have specularity to it uh, is the best type of material. I found even the plastic, uh, you want a flat, flatter color plastic. The specular highlights make it harder to see the, the uh, actual 3D shape that's there. So if we want to put this out, oh, incidentally, if you want to move one of these, like attach it to a pendulum or something, uh, I showed in an earlier video how to attach a photo to a pendulum. Uh, you can do it the same way. It will move or rotate with gears and so on. Um, but you can also move one of these objects. If you click on it and then hit the button down here, move and grave, you'll get a message on the screen saying you can now pick up your picture and move it. And this will allow you to place it wherever you want on the screen. Hit any of the resol of the perspective buttons and the item will then be locked in place again. And again, to send it out to an STL, we just select the object, hit the STL screen, select the object on the tree again, output all individually and say export as STL. And away it goes. It's done. Uh, once the progress bar at the top goes back to zero, uh, you're done. You can go back to your project screen and then uh, pick or tool screen and pick whatever you want for tools. So um, that's pretty much all that you need to know to play with the stereo photometrics module for the summer. Uh, I am going to uh, probably pick up uh, and do more development on it in the fall. I can see where it has a few possibilities to make it even more attractive. Uh, perhaps we'll see if we can put it out in a different format. Please post anything that you uh, make with it. Um, and let's see what gets done with it during the summer. And have a good summer while you're at it.